All right, guys, hopefully uh, you're able to see us and everything's good. My name is Toby Mathis, and I'm joined with Carl Zellner. What's up, brother? Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, it looks fun. Get to talk a little tax today. Yeah, everybody's going to ask, where is brother Jeff? And I'll just <laughs> tell you, Jeff doesn't even know his own name anymore. He's pretty much in the throes of tax ecstasy, so... He's uh, unable to join us right now just because, well, he's probably got about 500 returns on his desk. <laughs> All right. Um, so welcome to Tax Tuesday. I only say that partially in jest. He's not drooling, but he still knows his name, but he is in the throes of the tax season. All right. If you can, uh, let us know where you're from right now in the chat. So this is Carl. Have you done a Tax Tuesday before? I have not. So no, it's my first tax Tuesday. So uh, Carl is one of our attorneys. We start starting to see some names. Put in where you're from, whatever city and state, San Jose, Bellevue, Chicago, Charlotte, Napa, Las Vegas, Miami, Florida, Dallas, Texas, Granite Bay. Now they're going in too fast. Austin. Hey, you were outside of Austin, right? You were in Georgetown? Yeah, I grew up in Georgetown. So just north of Austin. There we go. Mantica, there's Dallas, where you just were. Los Gatos. We know where Los Gatos is. Uh, Union City, Baltimore. Got a bunch of properties there. Hate your city. <laughs> you're, you're not, not, not the city, but the people that work for your city are just, they're not much fun. A lot of California here. That's because it's tax season and y'all just got hammered with some tax bill and you're like, I'm, you're just, you're limping through the, the end of the year. There's like, oh, gosh, there's a, a PA. You've learned what salt is. <laughs> Take local tax deduction. And you learn that they capped it at 10000 if you're in California or PA or New York or Connecticut or Maryland. You've learned that you don't get to write it all off, right? So uh, let's see. We got a lot of folks. I'm waiting for a few more to drive on in. And then we will get diving on. <laughs> uh, hey, if you have questions, the chat feature is where you ask clarifying questions while we're teaching. And if you are uh, asking a question that's specific to your situation, please ask it in the question and answer. It'll say Q&A on the Zoom. And we have a bunch of folks helping you out, even though it's tax season. There's a few hearty souls that said, hey, I will help. And uh, specifically, oh, I see Troy popped in. I see Jeff is still floating around out there. He's probably just listening to see whether Carl screws up and he can make fun of him. Um, Dana it, Cummings is on. Uh, tax professional Troy but Butler's on. Jeff, I assume you're probably just listening. I'm not going to make you answer questions. Elliot Thomas, one of our tax attorneys, is also on. And, uh, and uh, we also have Matthew and Ander and Patty on. Uh, somebody says, I sent in a question earlier. Do I need to send it in here now? I would send it in, Jim. What we do is we get about 500 questions a week that come in via email. And I'll actually put that email up so you guys see how the, the rules work. And uh, we pick about 10 to 15 of them and throw them on. We just grab them kind of in at random. We're not really going through them too carefully. I just look and say, hey, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, and we answer those. We are also responding to people's questions. If they're generic, we just answer them. Uh, if it's very specific to your situation, you'd have to become a tax client or a platinum. Platinum is really simple. It's $35 a month. If you've never heard of that service, by all means, let us know that you want to hear more and you get unlimited access to our attorneys and you ask any tax question you want. And there's no billable time on it. It's just a set amount per month and cancel any time. You know, we're, we were about as easy as it comes to work with when it comes to uh, lawyers and accountants, just because we've all been there. We don't like getting burned with those big bills. So we're pretty mellow. Uh, it's supposed to be fast, fun and educational. We like to teach. And so whenever we get a question, you'll see that we expand on it and then start giving variations on it simply because we're trying to illustrate certain points so that you learn more and you continue to learn from each other and each other's scenario. And then when something comes up that affects you, it'll trigger your memory. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll, we'll get jumping in. Um, Carl, give a little two seconds on yourself on, on, on who you are, what you are, what you do all day. 
Yeah. So my name is Carl Zellner. For those of you who are familiar with Coffee with Carl, I am Matt Carl. Uh, like Toby mentioned, I am one of the attorneys with Anderson Advisors. Uh, I sort of head up our attorney department. So if you're working, if you are a platinum client already, uh, and chances are, number one, we've probably talked to each other. Uh, number two is if you talk to one of the attorneys through any of the many routes you now have to talk with us, uh, yeah, I help maintain that system. So on a daily basis, I meet with a bunch of clients. We go through some differ, different levels of analysis, depending on what you're doing. And we try to get you the best picture we can on both the asset protection side and the tax side. A couple key pieces, asset protection, you got to plan for it because you never know when it's going to pop up. Tax, you have the ability to plan for it in advance because you know it's going to pop up. So from those two sides, we get a pretty complete picture uh, of what's happening. So pleasure to be here with everybody, and I will chime in where I can. All right. So we're going to give you a quick taste of how it works. So uh, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of questions that we're going to answer today, but I'm just going to show you how spontaneous we can be. So somebody asked, can you put an LLC into a trust to protect it from probate, or is there another way to protect it? Actually, what you just hit on is putting into a living trust to avoid it from probate. That's a perfect way. And yes, you can have an LLC being owned by, for example, yourself as trustee of your living trust. See, easy one. And then somebody else asked, is your solo 401k owns a C-Corp, 100% of a C-Corp, can you still be employed by the company? Hmm. They're hitting on the right topic. There's something called a Rob's Transactions where, yes, you could be a uh, owner, shareholder, along with your 401k. It's actually settled law. And depending on how you set it up, the answer is yes, you potentially could. But it's like anything. You got to make sure your documents are very, very clear because you can't be using your personal efforts to make the investments worth more. So it's always kind of interesting. So we got to be careful on that. So you'd want to be talking to a professional on that. Speaking of professionals, let's go over the questions that we're going to be answering today. And Carl, I know you haven't seen these, but I go through them in mass, and then we go through them one by one. So here's what we're going to be uh, answering today. Can you speak about conservation easement as a way to decrease taxes in the correct and legal way? Absolutely. Uh, if my spouse and I own an S-Corp and I'm not actively working for the company, do I have to take a salary from the S-Corp? Can all the distribution go to my spouse? We'll answer that one. I invested in a multifamily real estate syndication deal with my traditional solo 401k. Can I convert this from a traditional solo 401k to a Roth 401k? If so, how do I determine the value of this conversion? Note, this is an 80% leverage deal and I know my percentage of ownership. So we'll go through that. Good questions off the bat. See, this is how fun it is, Carl. You're probably going, man, this is too easy. I'm having like flashbacks to the, to the bar. I'm just picking out issues left and right. <laughs> yes. And somebody's already asking, where is Jeff? So Jeff is in a tax coma right now. No, actually, he's probably listening. It's just tax season. We're two days before uh, or three days before the tax deadline. And our guys are going 24-7, working their katushas off, trying to get as many returns out as humanly possible. And I said, Jeff, don't worry. I'll do this one. We asked Carl, do you want to step in? Carl said yes, even though Michael had said yes before, then disappeared, and we don't know where he went. So, um, Carl, you're absolutely awesome. All right. I have a $750,000 IRA. I want to pay off my $300,000 mortgage. I'm 62 and a half years old and plan to work another 10 years. My annual salary will be at least hundred k. I want to be debt-free and start traveling. I know the capital gain will have a one-time impact on taxable income. I want to owe nothing and I can replenish the withdrawal if I wish. It's a lot in there. We will unpack that uh, and we'll go over the rules. Can an LLC buy back member units from an individual member? Uh, is doing this when members are IRA accounts a prohibited transaction? Interesting question. We'll go through that. Uh, next one, in order to reduce self-employment tax, could I lower my salary as a W-2 from my company C Corporation? What other form of payment other than dividends can I get from my company that would not require self-employment tax? Good question. We'll answer that one too. What is the capital gains rate for the year 2021 for the sale of stocks? Due to stocks tanking, I was forced to sell and take about 300. This is the sad part. I was forced to sell and take about $300,000 in long-term capital gains. <laughs> I was forced to sell and make a lot of money. 
Uh, did President Biden's proposed low capital gains rate ever get passed? <laughs> I just love that. That is an interesting question. I don't think uh, Biden was proposing a lower capital gains rate, right? <laughs> um, you could learn that one the hard way. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, what line numbers on tax returns are the most important when trying to qualify for funding as a self-employed sole member LLC as a real estate investor? I'm purchasing property as little as $80,000 to $500,000. I want to ensure my tax returns reflect as needed. So they probably need to get funding, funding, funding. All right. Can you provide an example of how to utilize the charitable remainder trust to reduce or eliminate taxes from the sale of crypto stock or a business? Absolutely. Where do you place in your personal tax return and on the corporations to return the initial investment as a board member at a nonprofit company? Can it be recuperated or does it become a tax deductible donation? We will answer that. And then the last question we'll be answering today is if I want to establish an Airbnb from my timeshare, how do I structure my entities and what is the best way to operate that to save tax? So we got a lot. You ready, Carl? I'm ready. All right. And I hope you have until midnight to, to, to work through these because uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Can you speak about conservation easements as a way to decrease taxes in the correct and legal way? Is this something you want to jump on? So I guess I can give sort of a 10,000 foot view a little bit here. So usually these type of things, especially conservation easements, you're really talking about donating a property for a specific purpose. Um, so when I look at these things, especially when we're talking to clients, uh, first thing I want to look at is what is the mechanism of where you get to see the tax benefit and do you fit under that mechanism? Now, from that perspective, I'll say, I don't know all the rules to that mechanism. So I'll turn it back over, Toby. You seem to be super well-versed on these. Well, they're, they're, they're on the dirty dozen list from the IRS because they're, they're so ripe for abuse. It doesn't mean that they're horrible. It just means that you got to make sure that the charitable component is real and it's forever. So let me just kind of go over what a conservation easement is from 10,000 foot view. Since, since we're way up there, let's look down on it. Conservation easement is a real simple way of saying, hey, I'm going to give a charity like Ducks Unlimited a right to my property that does not extinguish. For example, I might give it uh, mining rights, mineral rights. I might give it development uh, development rights and say, I want my land to remain as is. So for example, our, our past president Trump had Mar-a-Lago and gave charitable uh, conservation easements uh, to nonprofit organizations, qualified nonprofit 501c3 <clears throat> land conservation companies. And he gave the development rights of those uh, uh, four, I think it was three of the six parcels that make up Mar-a-Lago and received a pretty massive uh, tax deduction, over $5 million for tax deduction. So you could do it individually or you could do it as a group. So like I could buy in, Carl and I could get together. Let's say Carl had farmland in Texas and he loved it. And he was a cattleman and he said, I love this. I'm having a little struggle. I don't wanna sell this land. I wanna preserve it. And so he knows that the development rights, like somebody next door sold their land and developed it. And they know that the fair market value of that thing is, you know, X millions of dollars. And so Carl says, you know what? I don't want to see this ever developed. I don't want to sell it to a developer, even though I could get a big payday. I want to keep it the way it is. And so I will give, I'll bring in an investor to get some liquidity. So, so Carl doesn't have to worry about making a living anymore. And he can give the development rights to a charity. And in so doing, that land is preserved in the way it exists. Now, as the investor, what you get back is a charitable deduction based off of your interest. So if you bought in and you have your interest up to, I think it's 60% of your adjusted gross income per year for, for five, uh, excuse me, for the year that you make the contribution and then up to five years in addition. So six years of charitable donation that you could actually get based on the fair market value of that gift. And so this is where it gets interesting because people give things to charity, but they'll have strings to get it back, you know, and they'll say, but if you do this or this or the other, then it reverts back to me. You didn't actually give it. 
or it'll be for 30 years, or it'll be some some other number, or they'll inflate the uh, appraised value. Like they won't actually have ever done a development and they'll come in there and they'll say, hey, we'll say it's worth $30 million to develop it. And you're going to get, for every dollar you put in, you're going to get a tax deduction of 14 or 15 bucks. Those are the ones getting torn apart right now because that's not a charitable gift. And because the uh, appraised value is inflated, it's not accurate. And so the IRS will look at those. If you are a 250% increase of your donation, you're in the safe zone. So if you're above that, then they may look at the organizer and make sure that it actually comports. If you work with any conservation easement company, there's a few that I like, make sure it's the development company and that they're actually doing this. Um, so this actually works great. Um, somebody's talking about the IKEA structure, yeah. I'm going to give it whenever we talk about nonprofits, IKEA is my favorite nonprofit. <clears throat> Everybody goes, IKEA is not a nonprofit. Actually, the ownership is of all the, uh, of a big chunk of all of its rights, including its franchise rights. Anyway, so that's conservation easements in a nutshell. Why do people do conservation easements? Because A, they want to do good, and B, they want to get a big charitable donation. So if I put $100,000 in, I may get a $400,000 tax deduction. Then the question is, did I make more off that charitable donation than I would have paid in the tax? In other words, I gave up a hundred thousand dollars, and how much is that deduction worth for me? If well, if I'm at thirty-seven percent, then I can do that math fairly easily, and I could say, hey, you know, it looks like probably what about one hundred fifty thousand. So I, I net a little bit of positive, but I'm doing something good too. If you're going above that, you're playing with fire, and that's what the IRS keeps cracking on. Fun one, Carl? Yeah, no, man. Hey, I always like learning a little bit extra. Like I said, I sort of know enough to know I need to either research or ask more questions. Yeah, well, that's all it is. And that's the thing that I, whenever we teach this, we teach it to, to, to folks, uh, is make sure that you are learning, like when you're looking at taxes, you start asking the question, how? instead of a can I, you just say, how can I reduce my tax on this transaction and give it, give, give a creative thinker some, 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 uh, something to work with. A lot of people just say, I'm paying too much in tax. Well, okay, let's start breaking down things and what you're able to do. Um, here's the next one. If my spouse and I own an S corp and I'm not actively working on the company, uh, do I have to take a salary from the S corp? Can all the distributions go to my spouse? Carl, what you think? So within what you're flagging on or what uh, I guess the question here is asking is, so within the S-Corp, there is a reasonable salary requirement. So when we look at that, we say, you know, what the activities you're conducting, should there, is there profit to pay a reasonable salary? Um, from my experience, when we start digging into folks not actively working in the S-Corp, sometimes they are actively working in the S-Corp. So we need to look at the specific scenario. Um, but if you're literally not doing anything that would normally generate a salary, I don't think, or my, I guess I shouldn't guess, but I would suspect that if it's not something that would normally require a salary, it wouldn't be there. Um, you also said, can, can all the distribution go to your spouse? If there's enough money that would be there to pay that reasonable salary, it wouldn't all be a distribution. Um, next sort of logical question is always what is reasonable? And I just say, great question. What is reasonable? Because the IRS doesn't define it either. <laughs> a couple of courts have taken a knock at it. They usually do about a third. But here's, here's the interesting thing. So, uh, Carl, when you're saying actively working or using the, the client word, the, the, the material participant in a business is, is the dictating of whether you're doing any services. Uh, how much time you're spending on that business is going to indicate whether you're entitled to any salary or required. And what the big thing is that, that Carl's hitting on is that if you are participating in that business and you're taking distributions, then you have a requirement to take some sort of pay. And it says salary, but it could be a, a lower wage. If you are not participating in the business, then you don't have a requirement to take a salary. It's only if distributions are made does that does that salary requirement pop in? So there's always this thing like, hey, I'm working for my, my S Corp. 
and now I have to pull a salary out. My accountant says I have to pull a salary out. And I always ask, are you taking the money out of the company? If you're not taking the money out of the company, there's no salary requirement. If you're taking distributions, then there is. Now, rule number two is distributions have to be equal. They cannot be made disproportionately. In other words, I can't have one person in an S corp taking out 50,000 and the other person taking nothing. If it's profit, it's coming out to you guys and it has to be equal. Um, so if you're a husband and wife and you're saying, can I have hundred percent going to my spouse? You'd say, no, you'd say, no, a hundred percent can't go to my spouse, but it's going onto a joint return anyway. So it doesn't make any difference. The bigger question is, Hey, can I have distributions? And I'm not, I'm just a passive person. Do I have to take a salary? And the answer is no. If you're really not doing anything in it, as long as your spouse is taking a salary, then you're fine as long as you're, you're that's called a passive interest and that's very different passive is different than no self-employment tax no salary there's a there's a there's a distinction when you do not materially participate in a business then you're considered a passive business owner and then that distribution could be considered passive income too so uh, and you accountants out there know the difference and you're looking at it going hey Wait a second. Yes, that's that's very different than just a uh, not being subject to old age disability and survivors insurance or Medicare. Um, so the answer to the question is, you're not actually working in the company. Do you have to take a salary? No. Can the distribution go to my spouse? No, but it's going on your return anyway. You guys are joint owners. You would take it in proportion to your ownership. All right. Um, Let's go to another cool one. Oh, infinity. That's a really cool question. <laughs> Somebody was just at, no, I'm just kidding. Hey, uh, we're teaching another infinity investing on Saturday. Infinity investing is absolutely free. I bring on PO Washington to talk about stocks, how to invest as a stock market landlord. And I bring in Nicole DeBrasio to teach about uh, real estate. And sometimes Aaron Adams sticks his head in. It's a ton of fun, no cost. You get a free basic membership. We have three trading rooms a week that are absolutely free that you can pop into in the basic side. And you can learn how the wealthy keep their money over a long period of time. Hint, hint, it's not watching cable news. Hint, 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 it's not doing what all these gurus say. It's actually following tried and true things that work. And the reason I know they work is because we do over 10,000 tax returns a year. And we always look at the returns at the end of the year. And I start looking at like, who's making the money? What are they investing in? What are they doing? And well, lo and behold, you figure out that the, the people that are making the money year in, year out. And I don't even, you know, I don't even care about what they show is the taxable income. I'm looking at what's the cash flow popping in. If they have depreciation, don't worry. We know how that game's played too. I'm looking at the people making the bucks. And I like to share what they do. And that's what Infinity Investing is all about. It's free. It's on Saturday. If you want to uh, register, simple link. I think Patty shared it out. And don't worry, we, we don't even have like a sales group with that. So it's not like you get beat on like, hey, come in here. We actually just try to get people to make money because hopefully you'll, you'll come over to Anderson and use us for your tax services when you start having that the problem like this this some of these next folks when they're like oh i had to i had to make three hundred thousand dollars in capital gain this year oh you know so i don't want to pay the tax on it mm -hmm. there's some things you could still do all right enough of that um i have seven hundred fifty thousand dollars in an ira and i want to pay off my three hundred thousand dollar mortgage i'm 62 and a half years old and plan to work another 10 years my annual salary will be at least $100,000. I want to be debt-free and start traveling. I get it 100%. I know the capital gain will have to have a one-time impact on taxable income. I want to owe nothing and I and can replenish the withdrawal, withdrawal if I wish. I don't know what that last sentence means, but Carl, take a whack at it. Yeah, so one thing, whenever it comes to retirement accounts, whether it's IRAs, 401ks, um, Annual salary around 100,000. First thing I want to look at is what is your effective tax rate and where do we want that money to go? Um, with the IRA, you're, limit, you're a little bit more limited on how you can take money out through, say, a 401k. You could always do a loan. IRA, technically, you would just be taking advantage of a 60 day rollover, which I don't think <laughs> would get you where you want to go uh, for your mortgage payment because you'd have to basically put it all back in pretty quick. 
Um, age is definitely relevant here. I don't remember the exact age off the top of my head where you can start taking out uh, distributions without the penalty, um, but you're probably getting close there. Yeah, you're at 59, uh, I think, or yeah, 50. 59 and a half. Is that it? Can't remember which one it was, but it's it, it, it's in the 50s. I think it's yeah, 59 and a half or something like that. Uh, to, to me, I, I maybe I'm missing it. I don't see a direct correlation between the IRA money and paying off your mortgage. Mm -mm. I think you're hitting on something there because I, I always look at it and say, yeah, could you? Yes. Should you? Maybe 59 and a half. There we go. So everybody's popping in. We got some accountants out there, Carl. And I know, I know, uh, I know the person that did that. We used to, we were good friends on the uh, platinum office hour. Really? Yeah. We like it. You can say his name. You just don't say his last name. Michael. Yeah, it was Michael. We used to, we, we had a good old time. It, interestingly enough, it's funny because it used to compete or not compete. It was at the same time when uh, tax Tuesday would go over. So we'd get overflow uh, after y'all wrapped up. Oh, I apologize for that. Tax Tuesday never goes over. We're always. You know. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. So you're 59 and a half. You could start taking distributions out of your traditional IRA. If this was a Roth IRA, so it just says IRA. I don't want to make an assumption, but if it was a Roth IRA, you just take the money out, pay off your mortgage. Yay. If it's a traditional IRA, then you'd pay income tax on it and it would add on to your existing. Uh, <laughs> somebody's, they're, they're already trolling me, Carl. Sometimes. <laughs> don't be mean. Don't be mean to Toby. Yeah, Toby's nice. He's but we used to go way over, but now we're just maybe going over. <laughs> All right, so we're uh, you know so the way I look at it is you have ten years of making a hundred thousand dollars. We're looking at your tax bracket. You're right. You know what are you looking at? Like the twenty two or something like that. It's it's not massive, and you have your standard deduction. We'd be looking at any other things. Are you doing charitable donations? Should we do those straight out of the IRA instead of? Uh, instead of having those be taxed to you, uh, should, should we just make them directly out of the IRA and, and do that in case you're tithing or something? So if you're making 100000 you're used to giving $10,000 a year away, uh, maybe we should do that. Um, do we have any other uh, accelerated depreciation that we can take advantage of, real estate professional status? Are you, do you have any losses that are flowing forward? All those things go into the into kind of our little bowl of what we're going to cook up here and say, is there a reason to take the money out early? Now, I'm looking at us saying that we're in an inflationary period where we're above probably 5% and the interest rates on mortgages are below that, about 3%, 2.99 last week. I don't know what your mortgage interest is, but I'd be looking at that very closely to say whether you're better off hanging on to that debt and letting that IRA cook a little while because you have about uh, 10 years before you have to take required minimum distributions and you're gonna pay less tax on it if you wait that 10 years. So I'd probably wanna play around, um, I'd probably wanna play around with the numbers to see whether it's better off. Uh, something else that's out there, this capital gain, um, you don't have a flow through of the type of income out of an IRA. It's just ordinary income to you. So we're not going to be at capital gains rates. You're going to be at your ordinary tax bracket. So if that money comes in, so let's say, for example, I start taking out an additional $30,000 a year. That $30,000 is going to be added to my already $100,000 salary, which might be going up. So you're going to be at $130,000. You're going to be paying tax on that. You're probably going to be paying six or $7,000. Would you be better off leaving it in the IRA and letting it bake and continue to grow tax-free and paying that lower interest rate on the mortgage. I'd be really, really tempted to, to just keep that mortgage. I know what you're saying, that you have the cash to pay it off. And I'm a big believer in knocking out your debt, not a big debt lover, but you already have the mortgage and you have the money in a tax deferred vehicle. The benefit of a tax deferred vehicle is letting it cook as long as possible until you're required to start taking it out. And then hopefully your income's even lower. So if, if you leave your job, and you're no longer $100,000 a year, what's that $750,000? What is it gonna be worth in 10 years? It should be probably close to 1.5, if not 2 million. And then I start taking that out as a required minimum distribution at a much lower tax rate because I'm no longer making that salary. I think I may be better off doing that. So that's the fun part there. It's getting doing the math on it and 
realistically, you should actually have somebody crunch the numbers for you and say, hey, look, this is your long-term prospect. And it might be a certified uh, financial planner. It might be an accountant. It doesn't necessarily have to be an accountant. It's just somebody who's going to say, hey, wait, here's our growth rates. Here's what the S&P has been doing, or you're know, looking at what you're investing in, looking at what your uh, interest rate is. You are getting some deduction on that, assuming that you're not doing the standard deduction, but let's just, you know, it might be that you're getting some benefit there. We'd have to take all that into consideration to make a smart decision. And what's sort of wild there too, is that the amount of folks we run into that have those sort of large, what I would term at least large IRAs out there. And I know, I know for me personally, I went through the infinity investing. I like it. I traded in my trade in my Roth, trade in a personal account, and it's been great for me. Um, I would, like you say, I don't know that I would mess too much with the mortgage, especially with the interest rates where they are. But certainly, you can put some of those retirement funds to work as well and grow it. So you know, it's not the same thing, but you're still getting a net benefit out of the money. I think the direct correlation was you wanted to pay off your mortgage with your retirement account. Mm -hmm. Think of it, a di you know, sort of blow that expand that picture and investing with that retirement account, you probably get a pretty similar bang for your buck at the very end of the day. If you can actually grow that account, take it out at a lower tax rate, and then just use it to your plan once you've got control of it at a better time instead of penalizing yourself. Yeah, we have two good comments here. Question asked about capital gains out of an IRA. Can't, it's all ordinary income. You're absolutely right, Mike. Uh, Will, who's a CFP, says great advice. See, <laughs> we like the CFPs out there because they're fiduciaries. You don't use a broker because they make you broker. No offense if you're a broker. Thank you. Come on, it's in the name, right? Use the CFP. All right. Can a LLC buyback member units from an individual member uh, is doing this when members are IRA accounts or prohibited transaction? What say you, Carl? Yeah, so technically, yeah, your your L, the LLC as a whole could buy back member units. Usually, when you're looking at the member units in an LLC, though, um, ownership's dictated as a percentage. So, depending how you're doing it, it may not change a whole lot. Um, mm -hmm. Is doing this when members or IRA accounts are prohibited transaction? It depends. So, it would depend a number of excuse me number of members could be relevant. Who those members are. Um, the end, the members that would be sort of funding the purchase return of those membership units. Uh, so yeah, that's, I guess, sort of the overarching point here is with a IRA accounts or retirement accounts, we tend to lean a bit more conservative because those prohibited transaction rules can be a little sticky. That being said, we tend to lean more towards let's figure out how to do it than just tell you no. So I'd want to sort of dig into the details on this one. Yeah, and so the so can an LLC buyback membership units? Yeah, it's called a redemption, and it there's actually a pretty big difference between a sale of a membership unit and a redemption, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, whenever you're if if you fall under partnership law, you're going to have these things called hot assets, which is things like your inventory, uh, receivables. There's one other that I'm missing, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's like three main ones um, that where it's ordinary income. You have a uh, uh, recapture that you may have to be worried about if you're selling out or doing a redemption. You, I think you avoid the recapture on a redemption and it's sticking it to the other partners. In other words, if let's just say there's three partners and you have a bunch of recapture, 100,000 of recapture or something, and you redeem your interest instead, you could be leaving that 100,000 of recapture with your partners. They each get an extra 50,000 of recapture at some point. So they, they may be giving you a little stink eye, you know, giving you, hey, what are you doing? Right. So you have to be aware of those things as opposed to buying out. There's no prohibition on buying out and redeeming an IRA. I think your only issue is the arm's length transaction and whether you're a disqualified party. And honestly, I don't know the answer sitting here. I think you'd have to look at it to see if it's ever been done to see if the IRS has had an issue with it. Um, I don't think there's an issue with it. I know legally you could do it. It's just a question of um, whether you're getting any inordinate benefit and whether the IRS, you run a, an issue of having it reclassified as a sale as opposed to a redemption. 
And there are differences from a tax standpoint for that. It could be a considerable difference. Like you could even do installment sales and get this. If you do an installment sale and a redemption, I remember this, I could apply it all to my capital account first. So I'm not even paying any taxes that first, let's say I do a 10 year installment sale. I might be paying no tax on the money I'm receiving from that LLC for four or five years. And then the tax comes in those last bunch of years. So instead of making it like in an ordinary installment sale, you'd be putting your capital gains and your recapture and your interest and return of your basis all being separate. You can apply them straight to basis right in the beginning and, and not have to pay uh, tax. So it gets a little muddy. Fun stuff, right, Carl? So you thought it would be boring. You thought you'd come here and you'd be bored. No, I was afraid I was just going to be the one asking all the questions. So this is turning out better than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch of it. Somebody, uh, John says, withdraw from the IRA monthly to make the mortgage payment. Best of both worlds. You know what? You're right, John. There's a, if you're deducting the, if, if you're not taking the standard deduction and you're taking the mortgage interest, then you might just say, hey, I'll take it out and it's going to be a wash. The mortgage interest is obviously going to offset the, uh, the money you're taking out of the IRA. So that's a point well taken. Um, one other thing I want you guys just to, to stop and just, just cause I have a bunch of you guys on the line. Uh, we have a friend of our firm and, and Carl, you don't even know this, but, uh, Gene Greeno, who I've taught with on a number of occasions, super nice guy, residential assisted living Academy. If you don't know Gene, uh, and what's been going on, I'm, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I want to just take a second to pray for him because, um, as we are speaking, it's a very it's very likely that he's being taken off of a ventilator um, and will not be making it like he's to con continuing to decline. So he had uh, this COVID that's been going around. He ended up in the hospital and for two weeks, he's been on a ventilator really suffering to him and his family, Mona and Isabel. They're just really great people. And if you're just willing, I know some of you guys are in prayer groups and things, Gene Garino, just a really good all around person, his family runs something called the National Association or excuse me, the Residential Assisted Living Academy and has an association, a national association. Yeah, a bunch of you guys, so sad to hear. It. He's just a great, great, just a really good dude. Known him for a lot of years. Um, so if you guys could do that, I know some of you guys, I believe in that sort of thing. Not everybody does, but uh, if you're willing to, add them to your prayer group because it's probably going to be any any day now if not already and uh, i know his family i talked to mona this morning devastated great people great people um back to tax because it's uh, i'm not going to say the pun but something in taxes it always goes both of those things All right what lines on a tax return are the most important when trying to qualify for funding uh, as a self-employed sole member LLC, as a real estate investor. I'm purchasing property as little as 80,000 to 500,000 and want to ensure my tax returns reflect as needed. You jumped into this um, realm much? I wouldn't know the line number. Um, I would just, so looking at it, sole member LLC, self-employed, if it's a if it's a sole if it's taxed as a sole proprietorship, it's your individual return that's going to make the difference there. Yep. Oops. I'm going to see if I can find the line number. I don't know what I did with it, and I'm not going to be able to. Sometimes I have tax returns lying around. It's going to go off of your uh, schedule one. Anything that's going on a schedule E. Uh, anything that uh, goes off of a schedule C is going to go into um, what they call is a schedule one, I believe it is on the new 1040s. So I want to say it's like line six or seven down. You'll see it. It's after, um, it's, it's, it's before your total taxable income, but before the adjustments. So it's, they're always going to add all those things up. And thank you guys for all the chats coming in for Gene right now. That's really cool that there's a lot of people out there that know him. And, uh, I, was, I was just going to say on this one too, I am a, I am a, uh, I'm a firm believer in paying somebody else to do your taxes and not sitting at home banging my head on my uh, keyboard for TurboTax to accept some sort of formula I'm trying to type in. So uh, whenever I go in for a loan, I usually just have a packet ready 
and do that. So I guess that would also speak to sort of Troy's area and bookkeeping and one of the things we put a huge value on too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And talk to your mortgage broker before um, you're going to want to have a certain, especially for your sole proprietor, just know that it's really tough as a sole proprietor. Quite often what they do, when I say they, the mortgage underwriters are the ones, and we also have guidelines from Freddie and Fannie. They're going to use a formula for what percentage of your income they will allow. So if you don't have a W-2 income, it becomes a little tough. And if you're self-employed as a school, as a Schedule C, you do not have W-2 income from that business. So they're going to look at it. Some, in, some will not even underwrite sole proprietors because you could make the numbers dance, right? They're going to want to do a little digging. If it's on page one of your Schedule E, like your, your partnership, and you're getting a K-1, they're going to use 70% of your schedule, page one of your Schedule E. If it's Schedule E page two, which means you're getting a K-1 from a um, from an S-Corp, then, excuse me, no, actually page, page two will include the K-1 from a partnership. They will use uh, 100% of that amount. So we're always looking at it going, if, uh, yeah, excuse me just for a second. If it's a partnership or an S corp, they're going to use hundred percent of the amount. If it's from a schedule, uh, if it's from just regular rental income going on page one of your schedule, e, they're using 70%. So when we're um, looking to do a mortgage and depending on what type of holdings you have. So if you're a real estate for investor, uh, for example, and you want to make sure you qualify, talk to the mortgage broker and make sure that your return reflects what they want to see. And if you're close, the difference between getting a good loan and getting something that's more jacked up or having to go hard money may just be you and your spouse filing a partnership return on your, on your real estate as opposed to leaving it on page one of Schedule E. And that's because you'll get more, you'll get 30% more credit of that income. And that's not something that the mortgage company gets to play around with. That's the guidelines from the purchaser of that note. And since Freddie and Fannie are buying all these notes up, you kind of have to go with what they're saying. Um, and so in, they also have a really wide range of, of 80,000 to 500,000. It's pretty wild. Like right now, affordability of, of, of properties is really high because interest rates are really low. I'd be looking to buy as much as you can now. I know that the market's hot, but inventory is not going away. And something that I looked at, uh, somebody says 25% vacancy factor applied. So 70%, 75% of income used for page one schedule. E. Okay. Um, I'm not going to question it. 75% of income. So 75% on page one. And it, in, in sense, it sounds like you're a mortgage broker. I'm chatting and somebody's chatting right now. Um, are you using 100%? Are they still using 100% of page two? I go off of memory on this stuff. So sometimes I'm a little bit off. Yes. So perfect. That's why we love our community. Sometimes you guys teach us um, and then we get to share it with everybody. So that, that's perfect. And am I giving good advice, by the way, since, since yes, so they're saying talk to your broker, get it down first and make sure it's reflecting. Is there anything that they, uh, uh, yeah, each one teach one, that's perfect. Um, since we have a, since we have some folks out there that are in the mortgage industry, uh, are you finding it more difficult to get the loans on the schedule it sees uh, or is it relaxing now? Because for a while there, it was pretty, pretty uncomfortable. Let's see if anybody has anything or would you even want to touch somebody who's a Schedule C? Would you rather them be uh, go ahead and, and and incorporate, make their LLC taxable as an S corp or something like that? Let's see if we get any response. We're not getting any yet, so we'll keep going on. Um, anything else, Carl, on that? No, I, I like I said. I guess recently I went through and did a purchase, and I did the same thing. So it's you know sort of practice what we preach, right? I go in and said, "What do you want to see?" <laughs> you know, I've got <clears throat> my wife and I have a corporation, some different things, and mm -hmm. shifted around to what they wanted to see. Uh, the real golden rule: those who have the gold get to make the rules. So <laughs> this is the lines of the box. I said, "Let me squeeze myself in there," and went pretty smooth. Yep. 
Somebody says that uh, uh, read that owning housing is 30 percent over inflation rent is up 80 percent. So, Michael, uh, that's really good point. And what I've been watching. So out here in Nevada, there's areas that are 100 percent year over year increase. I think overall we're over 20 percent year over year nationwide. We're about 20 percent year over year on the housing market. The issue is uh, in 2006, the pricing of homes and what you do is you look at the rent. Uh, equivalent for housing versus the housing prices and you divide them and you end up with a ratio. And if the housing pricing is going up faster than the rent, you'll end up with a bubble and it'll burst. It'll be like 2007. So you could actually see that coming if you're looking at the ratio of the housing prices versus rents. So rents weren't moving in 2005 and 2006 as high as the, the, the house prices. Right now, they're both moving. You're not seeing that weird inflation. It's getting higher. Like I think that it, at its peak in 2006, we were at about 1.7, 1.6-ish. Um, and we're still in about the 1.3, 1.4 range now, I believe is what the ratio is, which sounds close, but it's it's not when you're looking at it. You're, you're saying, oh, we're about in the year 2000 is in the, the equivalent is, is to what it was. Uh, going to 2006. So like we're not out of the woods, like we could overbuild again and get out ahead of it, but we're still seeing inventory as the national inventory rate is 5.9 months, I believe with realtor association that, that they're, then I know that on uh, Fred, the St. Louis federal reserve puts out the data. It was at 5.9 last week. That's about average. It was down to 1.9 months of inventory of real estate. It was ridiculous not that long ago, just a few months ago. So we're seeing a cooling down, but the prices certainly aren't out of whack. So anybody who thinks that the real estate market's going to pop, I look and I say, well, there's one way to make it pop for the residential side, which is to make it less affordable by raising interest rates. But I, I, right now, they're not doing that until probably early next year. And even if they do that, they're going to have to go so slow. We still have historically low interest rates. It's ridiculously low. So the affordability of housing is going up. You have more competition. The only way I know to, to combat that is to raise interest rates, but they're afraid of destroying the economy since we're just now coming back. It's just a weird situation we're in, unprecedented. I don't just saw an article this morning that BlackRock is buying as much as they can get their hands on at this moment. Vacant land, anything, just We're whatever selling. they can have the funds for, they're buying it. <laughs> yeah, BlackRock has got that. What you'd look at is, is who owns all the different companies. It's it's uh, uh, There's not that many companies that own all these, especially, especially the media outlets. I think it's like three main funds, Vanguard and BlackRock and, and one other. Um, BlackRock is in our backyard. They came in here into Vegas and started buying everything up in 2010, 11, and 12. And we were flipping houses here, hundreds of houses. And the next thing you know, we're bidding we're, uh, on houses and they're going 20% over value. They're doing it again. They're buying at about a four cap on housing that should be a seven cap. And we're selling about 100 houses a month to them, Aaron and his group as uh, part of the Infinity Group. And they're buying anything and everything at four cap with the belief that the real estate market in the next three years is going up 15%. So I can just tell you, because we're selling to them nonstop, that's what they're doing. Now, I don't particularly care for that. I like areas where we're not competing with people that get money at literally 25 basis points. Why we have to buy, we, we get our money at 3%. They get their money at a quarter of a percent. And it's not a level playing field. I don't like that. So I like... Uh, you know me, guys. If you've ever been through Infinity, you know that I say you buy and hold forever. You don't sell. Every bad decision I've made involved selling something that I shouldn't have. I wish I had every house back that I've ever purchased. I'd be so happy right now. So don't sell things, especially to big, big funds, if you can help it. Um, oh, wait, here we go. Um, somebody says, can you provide an example of how to utilize a charitable remainder trust to reduce or eliminate taxes from the sale of crypto stock or a business? You like them, uh, charitable remainder trusts? They're not my favorite. So <laughs> I think they're cool. Um, there's some 
moving pieces that go into them. Certainly one of the hints is in the, uh, the, the name of them, right? You have to have a charity involved. Uh, usually you can pull some sort of income stream, but the ultimate disposition has to go to a charity. Um, and Toby's drawn up some buckets here. I like to draw things out so I remember them. So whenever you're, whenever you see a trust, just always remember there's three parties. There's the grantor, there's the trustee, and there's a beneficiary. So anytime you hear a trust, just know that that's what, you know, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a trust and then the name of the trust usually gives away. So when you hear land trust, it's a trust that holds land. So when I have a charitable remainder trust, then we know that the beneficiary, the remainder, see if I could actually spell remainder is equal to a 501c3. That's it. Now we have a grantor, you, so, and a trustee, which is you. So you're, you're sitting on both of these. Yay. And this is the secret. You could actually have your own 501c3 act as a remainder beneficiary. It's kind of wild. But what's cool is because I'm giving this to a trustee for the benefit of somebody in the future and for me now, I get a tax deduction. So when I give this, let's say that I have $1 million of crypto and I have really no basis. Let's say that I bought it really cheap. My this year, 2021 tax deduction for charitable giving is equal to about 30% of that. I'm going to say you always have to run the numbers. It's about 30. So I'm going to get a $300,000 deduction and it's going to go into the trust. It's going to be held by me for the benefit of myself during my lifetime. So I get lifetime money and a remainder interest. And so they then it depends on whether it's going to be an annuity trust or whether it's going to be a NIMCRIT or, or NIMCRIT, I always forget how to say it, Unitrust, whether I'm getting the income off of it that's going to come out to me or whether I'm going to get a, a, set, a set amount. So let's say I set this up and I'm going to get, let's say it's 6% a year, 6 to 7% a year. I'm going to get income for my lifetime of let's just say $60,000 a year. I'm just throwing out numbers, right? All this is always going to be subject to the, um, to, uh, what is it called? Uh, actuary who's putting it together or, or we're using the, the IRS tables. This would be taxable to you that $60,000 a year is ordinary income. You get a big fat tax deduction during the first year. And then here's the, the reason people like chair remainder trust is you don't have any tax on the gain. So the trust can go ahead and sell that crypto and invest it into something else and you have no tax. So you just conjured up a nice big fat deduction for yourself. If you wanted a bigger deduction, you just skip the trust and go straight to giving it to a charity that you set up. If you guys have listened to me for long enough, you know that I, um, I oftentimes say set up the charity, all the rich folks do the charities. Why do they do the charity? Because they work. Uh, money usually goes straight into the charity. Rarely does it come back out. Uh, usually they're just letting it grow and grow and grow and grow. There's tons and tons of examples of families that have done very, very well. Their kids could still work for the charity and pull out a salary, but you never, you're not giving your, you know, your, your, your son or your daughter, a, a bunch of money that they can't handle. You're giving them a purpose instead. And you're not giving them a Lamborghini. <laughs> you're giving them an income source, probably, you know, a modest income source. Like I know folks that work for their grandparents, trust where the parent grandparents passed the parents worked uh, excuse me went into a private foundation or a, a public charity in the case i'm thinking about specifically it's a private foundation and they make sixty thousand dollars a year brother and sister out of it they don't pull much out it grows and it's going to go to their kids are going to do the exact same thing and it's going to it's going to keep growing and growing and growing so it ends up working really really great uh but that's how it works you could do that with any appreciating asset the downside is hey i'm i'm getting income for the you know 
could be a set number of years. It could be your life. It could be two lifetimes. I believe we can extend it out over. Um, I get a nice big tax deduction now, but I do have it in a trust and it is going to go to charity. When I die, it goes to the charity. So if it's an outside party charity, your kids may be giving you the stink eye. Hey, mom and dad just gave away a million bucks. You know, that original million, it's going to go to charity when it's all said and done. So they look at it. Um, they give you the this. Where did it go? So some people, like the people that make their living selling cruts, charity remainder trust, they usually sell insurance too. And they're saying, hey, take part of this 60000 and invest in insurance, you know, buy a policy on yourself that replaces the million dollars, you know? So that's what they do. They do well at it too, because the numbers usually work out. I mean, I don't want to bad talk. I mean, it's not something I do generally because I, 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 I prefer to go straight to the charity, but uh, I'm not going to say that they're bad. Hey, if you like this sort of information, by all means, go follow us on social media. My favorite really is the YouTube. Uh, Clint does a great channel. Uh, Anderson has a channel. Carl, you're going to have your own channel. Ooh. It's Coffee with Carl. So uh, just don't spill any on yourself. So, and then there's uh, Instagram. What's that? Oh, she's putting up all the links. And uh, if you can find me on TikTok, you'll see that I get trolled relentlessly by all the stock traders or the, the option traders because I always tell them they're going to lose money. And they fight back. Like, it's like touching a nerve. You just watch them freak out. I'm always like, well, statistically, you have about a 1% chance of making money. It's like telling a gambler while they're sitting at the table, you're probably going to lose money. They just lose themselves and they start yelling at you. They're like, but I'm up, but I'm up. And you're like, wait until five in the morning and you won't be anymore. Right. Um, here's a good one. Carl, where do you place on your personal tax return, the corporate return, um, or and the corporate return, the initial investment as a board member a member at a nonprofit company. Can it be recuperated or does it become a tax deductible donation? What say you? You know, I don't know the answer to that one off the top of my head. Um, my, I guess my instinct is pointing towards, uh, you can sort of just go, yes, which one do you want, right? Do you want it to be some sort of reimbursement? Because usually you can have a reimbursement plan that applies to the board members. Uh, or do you want to treat it as a charitable investment into the business? Can you have a charitable investment in a company? In a, uh... Oh, Patty, don't share out my TikTok now. <laughs> That's horrible. I've been fighting with people and I'm not very like. Well, I guess it wouldn't technically be investment because you wouldn't be getting a return. So right. No donation. private inurement. Inurement. So it's not an investment. It's not a company that you're investing in. What are you doing when you're giving money to the, to a charity? Donating. Yep. So it becomes a donation. You're not getting it back. So yeah, somebody says I'm on TikTok. Hey, I have fun. They're like 60 second things. And I just, I poke at them. Just, the, just the, the crazy investors out there. So you'll see my smiling face. Um, my daughter likes TikTok. I don't, I don't think she follows me though. I think I have like three followers at this point. Not after you told her she's getting a job in your charity, not a lump sum. Yeah. She might stick around a little bit more. America's a good kid. All right. Um, it usually is treated as a tax deductible contribution. So just, it's not really like if you're putting money in they're you know, like, Hey, I set up the company. Like if you put it in ahead of time, you could say, hey, I want to get it paid back. I could see you doing that as long as it's documented ahead of time. Otherwise, just treat it as a charitable donation and don't set up a charity unless you have a real charitable, like you need to have a charitable bend to you. Uh, I would say that you're going to be really unhappy if you set up a charity and you're not charitable because <laughs> there's lots of rules that make it really hard to get like unfettered access to the cash that you put in there. Like you could take a salary out. We can do deferred compensation programs for you. It could cover business expenses. Anything's arm's length. There's so many cool things. You do some cool split dollar if, if you want uh, with insurance. You could do corporate owned life insurance. I love that one too. And just have a bunch of money dump in there when you pass. Um, but if you just like having access to your cash and you want to be able to take it out of your company whenever you feel like it, don't do a charity. Not the appropriate vehicle. There's plenty of others for you. 
All right. This is your, I know this is your, your bailiwick here, Mr. Zellner, because I've seen you do this before. Okay. If so, I want to, if I want to establish an Airbnb for my timeshare, how do I structure my entities and what is the best way to operate that to save tax? Okay. So there's, this is a, it's a deceptively short question with, with sort of deceptively uh, with some longer analysis here. So timeshare number one, I'll just hit it sort of as we read it. It's going to depend on the rules of your timeshare. So a lot of times if, I have, if we have a client come in talking about they want to Airbnb their timeshare, share, first thing we need to look at is the rules. A lot of times they're going to restrict the way you own that property, which can <clears throat> sort of change the strategy. Sometimes they allow for trust to own it, which is makes it a little easier. Sometimes you have these weird fractional interests in these condo associations where you sort of start to unravel it and figure out you don't really actually own much of anything at all. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do it. I would say if it's pretty straightforward or pretty easy, which is rare when it comes to timeshares, uh, you could hold it by, I guess, traditionally we'd use a land trust or an LLC, but really takes looking at the documents to see what's happening. Also see this stuff in like, uh, retirement communities, seen them a lot where you actually own shares in the community, not actual physical I don't know, land or have it say like a deeded ownership of a property. So it gets a little bit weird. Um, so structure, we start looking at, like I say, from liability side, usually some sort of land trust or potentially directly in an LLC, both are viable. Um, best rate, to, best way to operate that to save tax. We then get to dig into our friend IRS publication 925. So you, there's actually a few different routes or a few different ways money can be earned in a short-term rental. So there's like a normal rental property, you get passive income. Then there's passive income, or excuse me, active income, not subject to self-employment tax. Then you get a third flavor of active income that is subject to self-employment tax. And you have to look at those, like those rules Toby was talking about earlier with the, to what level are you participating in the business? So, Rule of tax Tuesday, I am told, is calculate, calculate, calculate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you look at is, first step is, is it a short-term rental? And to determine if it's a short-term rental, you look at the average length of stay. To figure out average length of stay, you look at number of bookings divided by, or excuse me, number of days booked divided by number of bookings, which will give you your average length of stay. If that average length of stay is, what is it, less than seven days, then it's considered a short-term rental. Then you move on to that next level of analysis to what is your material, what is your participation oh, don't, level? Don't, don't leave that off. What's seven okay. days or less? So I'm going to make a less than seven days. Okay. So, so what, is, what, what type of income is, is that rental income anymore or is that ordinary income? I believe that's ordinary income. Yep. So it's ordinary. So it's non-rental. So that's, it's no longer rental income. It's just ordinary income. So you're going to have two choices. You're either going to have active or passive. Passive is simple. It's, I don't materially participate. So if you participate, you're definitely going to fall into that active category. And the one other thing that they mess around with is do you provide significant services with it? Then you definitely have self-employment tax. So uh, it gets kind of funky. You can get like, what is significant services? It's something that a hotel would provide, right? Do you ever dive into that? Or I don't want to steal your thunder, but. I've dug into it. It's been long enough that I can't remember the verbiage because when you, especially when you're looking at publications, it's all about the, how did they stick the words together? <laughs> and is there something that backs them to interpret it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you're dealing in that, um, what, what ends up coming up for, for if you're providing significant services is something that is not ordinarily provided when you're doing a, a longer term rental. So it's, it's, did you become a hotel? So the way I always think of Airbnbs is, is it more like a hotel or is it more like a rental for a year? 
Like if I did a year lease, what do I expect to receive from the landlord? Do I expect to receive a bed? Mm, probably not. So check. It's more like a hotel. If I do get a bed, do I expect them to put sheets on it for me? Mm, probably not. Do I expect them to clean the sheets and do all the laundry during my stay? Absolutely not. How about after my stay? Probably not. Like, I don't even think they're going to give me sheets. Would they leave me a coffee maker and a bunch of coffee? Mm, no, that's, that's more like a hotel. And you start going down your little list and you realize that when you're doing seven days or less, it's a hotel which means it's going to be ordinary income. And the only question is, is it active or passive? And, you know, where is it going to land? If it's active, it's going on Schedule C. If it's passive, it's going on Schedule E. It could possibly go on Schedule E, even if you have um, providing significant services, but you're not materially participating. So you technically, you, you can actually have a passive sole proprietorship if you're not doing anything. It's kind of weird. Um, what was the IRS publication again? There's some folks asking. 925. Um, uh, 925. There you go. What's the other categories? The, of the types of income? And, or, or let's, let's do eight to 30. Oh, eight to 30 is just like a normal rental. So it would, so it would be passive. Yep. So this is by default going to be rental. It's possible that it falls out of the category of rental income if you're providing substantial services. And where you get substantial services is think of something where the staying at the house is incidental to something else. Um, like when I think of something different uh, or like, let's, let's say you're at a recovery facility. Don't go to a recovery facility. <laughs> Let's just say you're at a recovery facility. I'm a recovering gambler. Um, somebody says, look at that. Somebody, I got um, some cool views. Yeah, Richard, that's, that's neat. Um, let's say that I have a recovery unit. The actual stay is incidental to the recovery. It's not of, its, of itself. It doesn't have its own value. That would be non-rental. But if it's, hey, you're just getting a place and it's eight to 30 days, unless you're providing cleaning service, unless you're providing concierge service, unless you're providing um, food and things like that, it's going to be a rental, just like regular rental. And in that particular case, it's going to be passive unless you fall into a category of active participation or real estate professional. It gets funny. And then you go 30 day, 30, more than 30 days. So 31 plus. And then you have to have extraordinary services for it not to be rental. And extraordinary services are like you're literally going on a tour. Let's say you're going to go out on a three month tour or something. And they're just basically coming up with housing for you. Um, if you're the landlord on those, uh, or if, if, if you're receiving the money for that and you're, you're handling all that, then it's all just regular income. Otherwise, this is, all, this is also going to be rental. And then it's the same rule um, as the 88 to 30. How would, we, how would we make sure that with all these options that we don't screw it up? What's a good structure to make it so we don't have to care about this? So I would say a good structure to look at this is that ultimately we want the asset held just like we would hold any rental property. Which would be? So usually a local LLC holds title to the property. And if we're looking for a little extra anonymity and asset protection, we can have a Wyoming LLC sitting behind it as the owner. So you could have it owned by a holding LLC. So I'm just going to say Wyoming holding, but this is the big one. So now the property is sitting in here. Pretend that that's, I just made the roof on fire. Shoot. <laughs> here, I gotta, I don't want to do that. I'm going to give it a smokestack. All right. So if we want to avoid the issue where, um, 
we have to worry about this seven, this eight to 30 or any of these issues, the easiest thing you could do is rent it, you know, one year lease to whom, who should we rent it to Carl? Corporation. Yep. And Separate do, taxpayer. We do a corporation S or C or an LLC taxed as, and this is, this is equal to the host. Mm -hmm. And you just do it that way. I get into fights with Clint all, all the time on this because, you know, he, he likes the idea of doing the short-term rentals seven days or less and materially participating. And I'm like, how the hell are you going to materially participate? Most of our clients, you know, they're buying their Airbnbs in other States, but you know, point taken is that yes, you could have that be, if it's active, it's ordinary loss. I prefer to get this real estate pro on somebody and to do the structure but that's why you talk to somebody and have them actually look at your scenario. But uh, I think you're hundred percent right in that structure. You know, so this would be dealing with the host would be renting to the guests. And then this right here is definitely rental. This here is definitely ordinary. And we don't have to worry about it anymore. We don't have to dink around. Yep. And those, I guess it bears to mention too, because I'm sure they're just given the amount of people that are on here. Uh, those that understand or have, or have been influenced or use Airbnb arbitrage, this is that. It's just the ability to do it within your own structure. Yep. And again, you just look at it, you get facts, and uh, they're talking about Gilligan's Island on here. That is awesome. Um you guys can't see the chat all the time because we have people that solicit each other on the, the chat, but I do enjoy reading your chats. There's some pretty good ones that come in sometimes. Sometimes some are a little bit profane. <laughs> Usually they're from a guy named Jeff Webb. He's always he trapped under a pile of returns. Yeah. He's, he's probably trying to get his mind. He, I, I see him popping in here once in a while. I'm like, he just can't get away. Every time he tries to crawl away from, from Tax Tuesday, I just grab him and pull it back in. Um, somebody says, so if you are a realtor, how is that different? If you're a realtor, you could absolutely um, qualify. Oh, somebody says you two are, Mich Michelle, I know you're right there. You said some nice things for, uh, for Gene. I love that. We miss you. Uh, somebody who worked with us for a lot of years. Um, if you're a realtor, then qualifying for real estate professional is very simple for you because you're going to hit your 750 hours or 50% or more test, which is what removes your basically like this. If I have real estate, rental real estate is considered passive. If I want the losses from that activity, if I'm able to accelerate my depreciation and get big losses, if I want them to offset my other types of income, including my W-2 income from a spouse, my W-2 income, Etc. Like, so if I'm a real estate agent and I'm making $150,000 a year and I have real estate and I could have a loss of 50,000 because of depreciation, if I want that $50,000 to offset my 150, I need to be a real estate professional. To qualify for real estate professional, I need to meet 750 hours in the, in the realm of brokering real estate, construction, development, uh, reconstruction, going in, like anything in real estate. It doesn't have to be for my properties. It just has to be me. Then in addition, I need to do uh, be materially participating on my real estate. And the test is one spouse on a joint return has to qualify or one, one person on a single return has to qualify for the 750 in more than 50% of your time test. And both spouses together need to qualify for the material participation. Material participation is, there's seven different tests. The top three that I look at is, are you doing all the work? Then you don't have to matter about how much time you're spending. If other people are doing substantial services on those properties, like I have a property manager, then am I doing more than 100 hours in more than them? Or am I doing 500 hours and most importantly, that is per property, unless I ch choose to treat all my properties as one activity. So it sounds really complicated, but it's a check, check, check test. 
And if you're a realtor, we already have the first one knocked out. So you're absolutely um, going to be a real estate professional. And the only question is, are you meeting the material participation test on your rentals? This, if I don't want to have to worry about the seven day or less, and like, let's say I have five properties, two of them are Airbnbs, three of them are long-term rentals. My suggestion is if you can meet the real estate professional tests that you do the structure that we just mapped up here, because I, if I, if I am not doing rental activity with an Airbnb, that time does not count towards material participation. I want to treat them all as one activity. I want to be able to treat it as passive real estate activity, as investment activity. So I'll have all five properties now as rental properties because I'm leasing two of them to my host corporation. So if I have two properties here, and then if I have three other rentals out here, that are doing long-term leases, I can treat all of these together and add up all my time spent on all five for material participation. And if I made your head spin, I apologize, but that's, it is literally just kind of going through and saying, check, check, check. How do we get to from point A to point B? Um, here's a good resource. Go to our YouTube channel. I probably put a bunch of that up in, uh, in uh, on the internet and in our YouTube channel. Carl, you probably hit it on uh, on Coffee with Carl too. I think every one of us who's had put posted content on the Anderson channel has had a uh, real estate professional status. I think I even went through with a PDF and highlighted some portions too. Yep. I know it's not easy, but uh, it's fun. Uh, but go, yeah, go to the YouTube, check us out. We have playlists from each other's channels too. And uh so you're, there's there's no end of good information. Speaking of good information, I mentioned it earlier, but I'm going to mention it one last time. The Infinity Investing Workshop is on Saturday. If you know somebody who's struggling with debt, who is trying to, get, to figure out investments, is struggling with what should they be investing in, send them to us. We'll get their head straight. We'll point them in the right direction. It's absolutely free. The basic membership is absolutely free. The only thing that we ever charge for is we have an advanced uh, uh, workshop where you buy properties, where we sell properties that are generally six and seven caps. We're looking for cash flow real estate. We have funds. We bring in uh, all sorts of fun opportunities. Like, for example, we had SpaceX before uh, with our uh, investment bankers. We had Spotify. We had what's a couple good ones? SoFi. We had uh, Zipline. And then we just recently had Kraken. And we get into them early. If you're a credit investor, you get to do that. Uh, that's part of our advance. But otherwise, if 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 you just want to get good and grounded in your investments, by all means, come in and uh, and do the Infinity Investing Workshop and join our basic area. You could spend three days with Pia and Jason every week learning to trade for nothing. Why do we do it? Yeah, shout out to Jason Coop and Eric Dodds. You guys are awesome. Why do we do it? Because we are barbers and we are teaching you to grow your hair. Right? Yep. Somebody says, yes, they are amazing. All right. So you can join us by going there. If you like this sort of information, oh, heck, if you like watching the uh, or listening to the Tax Tuesday, like you can't stand looking at us, but you like to get the information, you want to turn it on, you know, one and a half times so you can listen to us faster, go to the podcast. You can absolutely do that. Um, a couple of other things. I'm seeing if there's anything else in chat. I know that they're answering questions. They've answered, get this, Carl. Do you see that? 115 questions they've answered. There's 14 outstanding, so they'll knock those out. But a big shout out to uh, Elliot and Dana and uh, Jeff. It looks like he's on there and Troy for during tax season, taking the time off to answer free questions. Troy, Dana, Elliot, Jeff, we'll even throw you in there. Um, and then a huge shout out to Carl for filling in for Jeff. You got big shoes to fill, even though you're a big guy. Jeff has, he has clown feet. He, his shoes are so big. Like Ronald. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's amazing. 117 questions. That's pretty uh, Big shout out to you guys. Awesome job. And yeah, Jeff, I'm, uh, 
I'm drowning in your shoes in the, at, at the moment, but it was fun to get a chance to chat with everybody live. You gave me somebody to, to chat with and to bounce ideas off. You're always welcome back. If you guys have questions in the next two weeks, since we do these every two weeks, send it into Tax Tuesday to Anderson Advisors. There's literally no cost. We don't play games here. We've been doing this for a long time. If you want to ask a question, don't be embarrassed. Even if you think it's a stupid question, uh, we'll make fun of it. No, I'm just kidding. We won't make fun of it. We'll just answer it and make sure that we get you guys uh, squared away straight up. Uh, if you need additional information, by all means, visit our website as well, Anderson Advisors. There's a ton of content on there as well, but we like sharing information. If you think anybody would benefit from this, we do live stream this on YouTube, so you don't have to register. So if you have one of those folks that's super private and they just, just you know, and you say, hey, if, if you want to get some good answers to questions and you don't want to pay three or 400 bucks an hour, by all means, come on and, and join these guys. We'll, we'll answer your questions the best you can. Got to figure out a way to get those questions from the YouTube side. Um, Patty, how do they do the YouTube? How do, is that where we're broadcasting? And I, I, I like to get it to where we're just sending out the information and th those who don't like registering for things. Um, I know Patty just said yes. I'm saying, how do you get to the, I guess you just go to YouTube and go into Anderson Advisors. We have a channel. Uh, oh, she's answering it too. So they're, they're, they're getting it to you. Yep. You just go to the Anderson advisors, just type in Toby Mathis or Clint Coons or anything. You'll, you'll find our sites. Clint has one, but Anderson advisor has one. And uh, we'll make sure that uh, we get everything answered for you. You can always come in and pop in. And like we see, there's always, I think we have usually about 10,000 people registered for these good little community. Not everybody comes up live, but a lot of them watch it later. And if you don't want to register, you just want to watch it as a live stream, you certainly can do that too, or live cast or whatever they call that on YouTube. The YouTube. All right, guys, that is it for us. Uh, I will uh, exit for uh, Carl and I, but you can absolutely continue to ask questions and the guys will finish answering up questions because they're awesome. So thank you, Troy, Dana, Elliot. Jeff, Ander, Matthew, and Patty, Pate, who is answering questions nonstop. So she always does a really good job. So it's a lot of folks that come on here and try to help you guys out. So take advantage of it. Thanks again, Carl. And we'll see you later. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody.